Okay, okay. Yeah. Jeff, 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 and then, started, Jeff. And then he'll take the questions. Yeah. And Terry, I'll have a bunch of questions. We'll start with those. And then yeah. Yeah. If, if you want. If you want. Everything yeah. 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 You're good. Yeah. And then, but it will also good morning, everybody who's in attendance of our rural schools webinar. For those that are on the webinar, if I could get someone to uh, just submit a, uh, a thumbs up or an OK, we can hear you through the questions. Or if you are connected through your audio on your computer or telephone, just say, uh, say we can hear you. Great. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Well, again, I'd like to welcome everyone and uh, also welcome Commissioner Holliday. Flew in last night and um, was gracious enough to, to be here this morning to be a part of this conversation. Uh, the way we would like to start this off is to entertain um, some of the questions that have already uh, been posed. And I believe Commissioner Holliday has those uh, on hand and can speak to those. Um, and then once we go through those uh, that have been gathered, we will start to take some of the questions that are posed through the uh, GoToWebinar um, screen that we have here at the SDE. So um, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Commissioner Holliday uh, to entertain some of the questions that have been asked. Thank you. Delighted to be with you uh, today. Uh, I was looking at the uh, similarities between Idaho and Kentucky, and uh, we have quite a few. Most of our challenges are in small rural districts where we have huge percentages of uh, economically disadvantaged uh, students, and the majority of which are, are white. I attended a recent meeting uh, of the state uh, school officers, um, and we were discussing rural issues. And what got my attention was a survey that had been done of Idaho superintendents, uh, asking them what the top three federal issues might be that impact rural schools. Idaho superintendents said that the lack of full funding for special education students was their number one issue. And the second was the paperwork and compliance, because if you're a small rural district, you don't have the staff to complete a lot of those federally required plans. And Ace to Stop and No Child Left Behind waivers impacted rural districts. Uh, you know, probably disproportionately. And then the third area you said was a top issue was lack of flexibility. So uh, it was interesting. They also asked people in Washington who probably wouldn't know a rural school district if they, uh, if they were in the middle of it, what they thought your challenges were. And they said recruiting teachers, retaining teachers, and lack of technology. So uh, interesting to see a different perspective between Idaho superintendents and uh, the DC uh, crowd. But your questions that we did receive tended to uh, focus on equity and uh, teachers. Uh, so uh, let's, let's kind of get started, and I don't want to make this a, uh, a long speech. What I want to do is have a dialogue with you and Q&A back and forth and try to let you know some of the things that our Kentucky rural districts are doing that, that, uh, that might help you. And also, hopefully, I can learn from you things I can take back to Kentucky to help some of our rural districts. Uh, your big challenge is teacher pay. Uh, you uh, are challenged that most of your neighboring states, when I look at the data, are able to probably pay a little more than your, your level. 
and uh, you also have difficulty. I, you'll get a young teacher right out of uh, university. You'll train them and work with them, and then they'll see they can make more in a neighboring or urban setting. So the retaining of your teachers there is a challenge. So uh, the other is uh, once you get teachers, rural districts tend to keep them a, a little longer because you've got a good quality of life and you also can form a lot of great relationships. But quite often your challenge is if you've got one upper level math teacher and they go to another district, it's very difficult for you to find other math teachers. So what are Kentucky schools and districts doing here? I think your biggest challenge will we're going to have to have some federal solutions like we're going to have to have programs like teacher loan forgiveness with teachers who would be dedicate three to five years to go into rural settings. So if you can look at the federal and state level and come together around a coalition to support programs like teacher loan forgiveness. Now, a lot of states are considering uh, recruitment bonuses, incentive bonuses, things like that, but there are some negatives to those because if you're a teacher in a rural district and you've been there for 20 years and you didn't get an incentive bonus to come to the rural district, you may be a, a little upset that some new uh, a teacher is getting a signing bonus and you never got one. And sometimes that creates a challenge between the uh, teachers and a building. Other things, like we've got a small district in Kentucky, Jenkins Independent, which is less than 300 kids, and they want to offer chemistry, they want to offer physics, and they want to offer biology but they couldn't find a teacher. So we were able to work with uh, Teach for America. We were able to build a uh, Teach for America program that only places teachers in rural districts where we have high needs in STEM areas, yeah, the math, especially the math and the science. So, uh, you know, trying to find money or incentives to level the playing field is critical, and you could do that through loan forgiveness, bonuses, or some type of state uh, salary structure that ensures equity, but that's probably beyond my pay grade. That'll have to be an Idaho-specific coalition, or you could do alternative certification programs. And then there was a small district, the poorest district in America, Owsley County, Kentucky. It's been documented as being the poorest. As a matter of fact, Kentucky has, I think, 10 of the, the poorest 20 districts in the nation located in our Appalachian region. They wanted to teach uh, uh, advanced placement. They had kids, uh, but they couldn't find a teacher. So what they did is they they did a service sharing agreement between uh, Madison County, Kentucky, Lee County, Kentucky, and Owsley County, Kentucky, where they actually shared a teacher. Uh, the teacher would visit all the schools so you'd get a face-to-face -face time but they utilize our online services, which the state provides to districts at no cost, so the teacher could do distance learning in the classroom and the, the, where the teacher was not located during the instructional time, the local district would certainly have some type of support personnel to uh, monitor and support the kids. The fourth thing I'd mention to you that is a possibility, we've got a district in Kentucky, Taylor County, Kentucky, 
That is completely mastery based, competency based. If you think about it, you know, uh, Kentucky, we've got some segment of homeschoolers. I don't know what you have in Idaho, but if you think about homeschoolers, you know, usually the parent only has a high school education. So the kids get to the high school level, you say, well, how am I going to offer advanced courses? How am I going to offer advanced placement? Well, the only ways they can get that is through some type of online program or some type of local sharing with other parents where they might come together and utilize a, uh, you know, resources within the community like a college professor, things like that. Finally, uh, one other thing I talk about, and I'm sure what I've mentioned will open up lots of questions. Dual credit. If you get to the high school level and you're wanting uh, more advanced level courses, AP is not the only solution. Dual credit agreements with uh, community and technical college systems can be a big help. Like in Kentucky, all of the general education, basic level college courses are offered online or they can be partnered with delivery at the high school level or at the uh, local community college. Now, if you're extreme rural, you're probably looking at some type of delivery method through uh, blended learning or online learning. But your questions will come about and how you pay the uh, tuition cost and that kind of thing. And all we've done is we've worked out in Kentucky kind of a shared cost for dual credit between the community colleges, state provided funds, and locally provided funds. So those are six pretty big uh, innovative uh, topics. When I read about Idaho, I see that you guys are already using pretty much all of those. So let's pause here and see if we have uh, questions, comments, follow-up <laughs> on those issues. All right, thank you, Commissioner. And and uh, what we will do is open it up, and I will I will uh, unmute uh, a couple individuals that have had their hands raised through the webinar. Uh, we will start with uh, Judy Sherritt. Um, I'll go ahead and, and uh, let's see if I can. Whoop, I just lost her. Oh, there she is. Judy, are you there? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, okay. I just raised my hand to let you know I was here. Uh, but okay. I do have a question, and that's. Uh, Regarding technology, uh, is there any any innovative way that, that uh, and in Washington they have ESDs, Educational Service uh, Divisions. In Kentucky, do you do anything to share technology between districts? You know, our technology coordinators, because it's not just special education that has, you know, that we have a hard time keeping and retaining and paying well enough. Uh, it's also technology. So, is there anything in that area that uh, you might be able to give us a little nuance on that maybe is different in Kentucky? Uh, yes, Judy. We, we provide regional technology support staff to our, through our regional cooperatives in Kentucky. For instance, Eastern Kentucky, we have a full-time person down there I, I can go to a district and help them with their technology focus. I guess the biggest thing, and I think uh, you guys have done this in Idaho, uh, we provide statewide solutions like we have one information management system, we have one finance uh, system for our school districts, we have one professional development system, we have one instructional content uh, system, So, and we have a... <coughs> I know Idaho's had some challenges with E rates, so let me put that on the table. I'm aware of it. Yeah. But your best solution is always a statewide uh, 
grant application through E-rate because the E-rate folks at the federal FCC are pushing more toward statewide solutions because you're going to save money in the long run and you're going to be able to provide technical assistance and support that small rules need because you're only working on one system rather than trying to uh, support and build like in Kentucky we have 173 districts so I know during the E-rate application process that's a huge amount of paperwork if you're a small rule it's extremely difficult to get you 470s and your 471 and get your RFPs and all yes. that so a statewide solution but what's critical is getting a lot of superintendent input in the development of those statewide solutions so yes under we have districts sharing technical staff and yes the state provides a regional tech support and yes the state can do a lot of it just online because of unified programs so does that regional tech support mean that individual districts may, um, you know, maybe of a, a district with 400 or less don't necessarily have to hire a technology person? Uh, usually somebody in the district uh, is wearing that hat along with about 10 others, you know how that works. But the, the regional tech person can be a tremendous support for helping troubleshoot networks and can bring in the technical expertise that sometimes a small rural district might not have anyone in the district with the you know, the high level technical expertise. All right. Well, thank you, Judy, for your questions. We'll move on to the uh, next individual with the hand raised. Uh, I will unmute Mark Gee. Hi, Mark. Can you hear us? Mark, are you there? Okay, we will move on. Uh, next question is from Jamie Holyoke. Uh, question concerns um, pay grade. What have you seen utilized effectively in increased funding equity? We are largely funded by pupil units. As a result, the bigger districts continue to get more as their enrollment increases, and rural districts <coughs> continue to get less as our enrollment declines. Um, yeah, well, that's uh, so true in Kentucky. What's, what's happened in our rural parts of Kentucky is there's no jobs, right? The coal industry has, uh, you know, been decimated in recent times, and those jobs are not coming back. So the parents move to where the jobs are, and typically the jobs are in the you know, suburban, urban areas. That means declining enrollment. And when you get paid on a per pupil basis, that means declining budget. So that is a vicious cycle. So the first thing, you know, you, you can't think of this in isolation as just an education problem. This is an economy problem. So in uh, Kentucky, our governor and the uh, Hal Rogers, our congressman from Eastern Kentucky, they've started a, an initiative called Save Our Appalachian Region. And the biggest push is on economic development and putting in place the infrastructure to, to really push entrepreneurship and to create jobs. So that's the bigger picture. You're not going to solve this problem with just asking for more money. Everybody wants more money. Uh, you know, I've, I was a local superintendent in uh, North Carolina. I was a uh, principal and teacher in South Carolina. And uh, my first uh, thing always as a superintendent was, we're underfunded. Uh, we need more funding. And I was in a district that was losing enrollment because of the declining economy. So I've certainly lived your you lived your life, but you gotta, you know, you gotta figure out how we could do things uh, differently, 
because I don't see the federal government or your state legislator putting in more money. You could come together and say we need at least a uh, base level of funding, which is a guarantee that uh, even if your enrollment dips below a certain amount, you would be guaranteed this level of funding. And usually that's some type of rural add-on. If you look at North Carolina and a few other states, you'll see this rural add-on kind of happen. But I think there, when you get down to it, it's either that you uh, change the economy, stop the decline in enrollment, or you begin to look at service agreements more aggressively between districts so that you could share costs. And you begin to look at more delivery methods that uh, we talked about earlier with the online, the blended, or the partnerships with your higher education or you look more creatively. The biggest thing the state can do to help you is to uh, work on those flexibility and paperwork issues. You really need to be able to take a consolidated approach to all your federal and state funding so that you're not expected to do the same as your large urban or suburban districts, we have a larger population that you have a lot more flexibility as a rural district to uh, write a unified federal plan, a consolidated plan, and with full funding flexibility so that you can utilize the dollars to best meet the goals of your plan. So uh, I wish I had a, a good clear answer, a simple answer. But, uh, you know, until you uh, address the local economy and the job situation, it, the money's just not, not going to be there because you don't have the tax base that a lot of your urban, suburban peers have. You can't just go out and raise a levy or a tax because you you got no business that you can draw upon. So, and grant money doesn't work for the long term. That's just one time, short term. Plus, you got to have a grant writer. And I bet most rural uh, districts in Idaho don't have a full time grant writer. So that's where the regional collaboratives. We've got a regional collaborative in Kentucky, the Eastern um, the Kentucky uh, Valley Education Cooperate, uh, Cooperative, and they got one of those big I 3 grants because all the districts came together and uh, were able to show the need. And it was like, uh, you know, uh, I think they were able to spread it over five years. But that's not a long-term solution. All right, great. I don't see any other questions that have come in through the webinar. Uh, no hands are currently raised. So if you have a, a question you'd like to ask, go ahead and raise your hand through the webinar or um, uh, type up your question. Uh, through the webinar form. All right, we have a follow-up question. I'll go ahead and unmute uh, Judy. Welcome back. Go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Yeah, um, you mentioned, um, sir, uh, about uh, um, you had one PD system. So could you talk about what that looks like in Kentucky? Uh, yes, we, uh, we have an online system that's available to teachers 24-7. And we connect that uh, to the professional growth plan of the teacher. And the professional growth plan is an agreement between the principal and the teacher about what what the teacher needs to grow on, and it's based on the needs of the students. Like if you're a, I see one of the questions that we received early, a district has a high influx of high need students. Say all of a sudden, you've been teaching in a rural district with a pretty homogeneous population for 10 or 15 years, and all of a sudden, you get a lot of uh, 
immigration, you get a lot of LEP or ESL kids, and you've never had training on how to deal with uh, with those students. You you don't need to wait until the state comes out and offers a workshop. You, you need it right away. So uh, in Kentucky, we provide that free access 24/7 to uh, a lot of high quality programs. And what we do as a state agency is we upload all of our trainings and make them available online. And a critical piece is through this software, they have all the social media tools that they need. They can um, you know, find if you're the only uh, physics teacher in the school district and you need, or the music teacher, and you need to talk to other peers across Idaho about standards or assessments or student learning needs, you can use the social media aspect of our software to connect to other groups, chat rooms. It's just like using Facebook or Twitter. It happens within the educational context. So, as you know, as districts have fewer and fewer resources for PD, I think it's critical for the state to help provide at least some minimal level of support especially for rural districts. Do you have a statewide mentor pro training program for, for teachers too? Uh, yes. Uh, well, we've had since 1990 Kentucky, a teacher is not uh, licensed until the end of their first year of teaching. And during their first year of teaching, they actually have a team of three people, the principal or assistant principal, college professor and a mentor teacher in the building to uh, actually evaluate them through a portfolio based model through the first year of teaching and then that team decides if the teacher should be should be licensed so uh, the mentors receive a stipend the college professor receives a stipend stipend and uh, that is state funded in Kentucky and has been so since uh, 1990 and we have about 2,000 new to Kentucky or new teachers a year in Kentucky. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. All right, if you have any other questions, again, you can raise your hand through the webinar or type up your question as well. There were a couple of questions that uh, came in uh, early. I think we've uh, hit a lot of them, but there was a good question about music art and uh, physical education. Uh, how do you fund uh, these non-core type classes? Well, you're, with music, it's awful hard to do that uh, virtually. I was a music teacher, and typically you got to have someone in the room now, I know nationwide there's a lot of interesting partnerships going on where you utilize resources you have in the community. As long as you have a teacher of record, you could utilize a lot of interesting things like a local dance an instructor who might help you with your dance, physical education a uh, personal trainer who might help you, but depending on Idaho rules and regulations, you know, you, uh, you know, there are always ways to work it out. And what we do with our very small rule in, in Kentucky is uh, work with them with the flexibility as, as long as we have a teacher uh, record that we can, you know, meet uh, federal requirements around highly qualified and you know they're, they're eventually you just have to kind of look outside of your school at the local community let me give you one state that is really doing interesting work with this New Hampshire uh, for a number of years have used a competency-based model it's kind of like a Boy Scout badge model 
that the kids are able to gain competencies outside of the school day. Like if you're in a local uh, uh, you know, singing group, if you're in a local orchestra, things like this, kids can get uh, badges which build up toward competency. Uh, we've got a school district in Kentucky, Taylor County School District, that is completely competency-based. They use a similar type of system. As a matter of fact, when you're looking at career technical education, you might not be able to uh, afford a, a teacher of diesel mechanics, but you've got a bus garage and you've got diesel engines at the bus garage, and as long as you work out the teacher of record issues, you could probably get CTE credit and have an apprenticeship, uh, internship type of program. So that's just one. Don't look within your four walls. Look at your whole community. And the state responsibility, and in talking with your state superintendent, I believe she's very much committed to supporting you and finding ways to help with flexibility uh, in uh, rural, rural settings. The, uh, the final piece is art, music, be those kinds of things really need to be in your state accountability model because if we, uh, if local communities are not accountable to make sure students have a balanced program of study, then those programs are going to be oftentimes ignored and dropped. So there are uh, many ways that uh, you, you could be flexible and creative there, and we've seen those all over the nation, not just in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. All right, I don't, I don't have any questions in queue at the moment. Uh, we'll give it a minute or so. If there are any other questions that you have, uh, go ahead and raise your hand or submit it through the form. One thing I did want to highlight is the special education. We have uh, special education cooperatives in Kentucky. Basically, we are a little more creative with our IDEA funds, and we put uh, we put most of our special ed staff out in the field working through our cooperatives. And so, like, if you uh, have a high need student come in and you're not uh, able to afford uh, the cost of that, the cooperative quite often can help you figure out you know, how to provide services on the short term and then work to develop service agreements with other districts, your neighboring districts, to reduce the cost of your, you know, your special ed. But again, it's looking uh, more at regional solutions rather than a one-size-fits-all federal or state solution. Uh, finally, everybody wants to know uh, how you're going to get more money when you can't pass local levies and you don't have any business. Uh, um, you know, this, this, uh, this is the same. Every time I have a superintendent meeting in Kentucky, this is number one mm -hmm. question. And uh, in 2014, we pulled together a coalition of all education groups. We were able to work closely with the governor and the General Assembly to make education funding the top priority. So unless you've got a really strong coalition in Idaho, what happens is You'll be a. Um, you'll have different groups. You'll have your teachers wanting one thing, your superintendents wanting something else. Superintendents will be split between rural superintendents and urban superintendents. Your higher ed will want something. What we were able to do, and it was a once in a lifetime thing, is everybody came together, including higher ed, on one focus and we were able to make a difference in the state budget because uh, your legislators and governor, they do listen to uh, local folks, especially when educators are speaking with one voice. 
when you're speaking with 20 different voices, you're pretty easy to pick off and uh, end up with nothing. All right, we still do not have any hands raised or other questions that are being asked. Um, we'll give it about uh, 30 more seconds. And if we have one pop up, we'll entertain that question. Uh, otherwise, uh, we will move towards wrapping up. So if you have any, any other questions, this is our last call. All right, we do have a question that has come in. Uh, what strategies have you employed to help educate stakeholders regarding issues unique to rural districts? And this is from uh, Superintendent McFarland up in um, Basin School District, Idaho City. Well, the number one strategy is you got to get them out of Boise and get them into uh, a rural district. They got to they got to see what a rural district looks like and meet people and hear hear face to face from teachers and principals and parents about the challenges that you face in rural. So uh, you know the back to school uh, legislative day is critical because I think the key people you're looking at would be your um, uh, legislators making sure they're aware of your challenges in, in rural settings. The other, it depends on, I uh, see you do have a rural schools association. I, the relationship building with key legislators is critical. And the uh, communication is not lengthy reports. What you want is one or two items that every rural superintendent follows up on and calls their legislator, and uh, you got your same talking points on the same issue. Don't overwhelm them. Keep it simple. Keep it uh, limited to one or two things that you all agree on, and kids can, can believe that it will help student learning and help more students achieve. You do need to make sure that uh, people are aware just in this nation, 50% of the school districts are rural. 25% of the students are taught in rural. I think it's much higher than that in Idaho and certainly much higher than that in Kentucky. So uh, the, uh, the urbans and large districts tend to get a lot of press. So you got to find success stories, innovative success stories that you can find ways to get press about. And uh, nothing breeds success like success and in innovation. Great. Thank you for that question. I, I, I'm going to take the opportunity to stand on the soapbox for a moment um, and just ask that you send me your success stories. Uh, we've been communicating that out for quite some time now. You may have seen uh, some of the feature story success stories that we put together here at the department um, that we send out and with the goal of, of taking your success stories and, and getting press uh, statewide. So rather than capturing your success stories and, and getting those published in a local media source, um, you know, send us your stories. We'll we'll do the legwork. We'll write the story, and and get it out and hopefully get it published. Um, so get in touch with me if you have any any stories you'd like to tell. And with that, um, well, I want to thank you for taking the time during the summer break to listen to. Uh, a uh, guy from Kentucky. Uh, I hope we had something to offer you. I've uh, been visiting with your superintendent this morning and uh, her staff here at the department. And I can tell you that I'm very impressed. I think you will see from the department and from the superintendent 
a real interest in being a service agency. I believe they're here to help you figure out you know, solutions to your many challenges. And I know they're wanting your feedback and your communication. So uh, I hope you'll follow that up. And uh, I hope that real innovative and creative because we would love to steal some Idaho ideas to take back to Kentucky. Thanks for listening in today. All right. Thank you, everyone, for being in events. Uh, again, if you have any success stories, get in touch with me. Or if you have any general questions on the webinar, uh, give me a call at 332-6934. And we will be posting this online for those of you who would like to listen to it again or uh, also for those who are unable to attend. So thank you again, and, and get in touch if you need to.